So um, I'm a nephrologist, and some days I also wear about two or three other hats. I run the solid organ transplant program for kids at our hospital. And so I get a chance to kind of hang out and do some, some fun things. And so I'm, um, my task here is a little bit talk about why does someone like me or my group get involved with an area such as mitochondrial disease. I have nothing to disclose except I've had a mustache longer than most people in this room have been alive. Um, and uh, beyond that, um, my goals are to discuss what are the impact upon renal involvement or kidney involvement related to mitochondrial disease. When the kidneys are involved, how does it affect blood pressure? How does it affect electrolytes? How does it affect urine output? And also, can anything be done to affect or to minimize uh, some of these complications of part of a systemic uh, uh, illness? I'm going to digress. I'm going to talk about probably one of my favorite diseases to talk about, which is lupus. Lupus is an incredibly fascinating disease. I've been doing this since 85 and um, do a lot of teaching with our house staff. All the vasculitis goes through our office. And one thing I always try to teach the younger generation, the house staff, is that if you understand lupus, you can understand any disease out there. Because if you look at the myriad of diseases related to lupus, you get brain involvement. You need neurologists like Dr. Teasley. You get cardiac, lung, and liver involvement. Uh, gut motility, inflammation involvement. In my perspective, in my world, you get kidney involvement. In fact, a significant number of patients have significant kidney involvement. You get joint abnormalities. You get t fatigue. These kids are tired all the time. And you get all sorts of perturbations and hyper and hypotension. And then you have lab changes. Lupus is easy. The reason lupus is easy is that you can diagnose it by clinical criteria. You can diagnose it by lab, lab criteria. You can actually place it in remission, and you can monitor it easily. Lupus is an easy disease. Let's change the heading. Mitochondrial disease. Last time I checked, that's the same myriad of symptomatology than a not unique just to what I would call systemic vasculitis, lupus is an example. It's a, it's a myriad of findings. So if you're a neurologist, you see children with one phenomena. You see a cardiologist, you see a child with something others. You see a pulmonist, a hepatologist, a motility doc. We've got John Fortunato just starting out a program this week. He's a, a GI, PGI motility doc. If you're a nephrologist, chronic fatigue syndrome, think about that. The problem with medical systems is that we actually have our blinders on, and we don't have a good sense of how to put the whole picture, picture together. That's why you need a team, and that's something I know Gene has rallied at our institution on. This is a very nice paper. It's really the only reference I'm gonna put out there today. It's by some friends of mine from, and I think this is, if I'm, am I correct in thinking these CDs are on your handout, is that correct? Okay, so this paper is there. Uh, Francisco Emma is from Rome, and his co-authors, um, co uh, one's from Bologna, one's from Padova. If you want to know Padova history, by the way, Padova, Italy is the home of John Paul I, a pope who I think was there less than 30 days, if I remember right. Uh, beautiful little town. But this is actually a great paper. It's in the journal that I look at a lot called Pediatric Nephrology. But actually, in this paper, it reviews the, not only the nephrologic relationships of mitochondrial disease, but it also relates, it looks at the systemic. And this is a nice uh, graph that actually points out every organ involvement, every organ disease, every affect, everything that occurs in this disease. You, guys, you all know about this more than I do, but I found, I found this paper very educational. So let's go back to lupus, why it's so easy to treat, but why mitochondrial cannot be treated. How do you, how do you identify something? It's your gestalt. You, you don't have a good lab data. You don't have a good lab data to help decide decision making. You know, the younger generation spend all their time at a computer and sucking blood on patients. Um, but we need to think about how do we examine patients, how do we put these in the concept. Excuse me if there's younger generation people out here, by the way. 
my wife and I have been uh, both in medicine for 30 years. We're going, can you believe that those guys do this? Can't they just examine the patient? You know, amazing concept. Um, the, uh, so I pre appreciate the comments over here, by the way. But you know, think about that. What you're really doing is you're taking a, a disease process that you cannot put your hands around. You cannot get a solid diagnosis. And you're saying, now what do I do? And that's really the world that you all live in. Uh, but let me give you my perspective, purely nephrocentric viewpoint of the world today. Basic kidney disease. There's two areas that your kidneys get affected. There's three, but let's talk about just the two. Glomerular and interstitial. Why is that important? But it's, I'll explain why it's important in a minute. Classic, this has nothing to do with mitochondrial. This goes back to your medical school classes and all those other things in chemistry that you all fell asleep through. Um, uh, Glomerular-based kidney disease, the classic three in adults, hypertension, diabetes, chronic glomerulonephritis. People seek out medical uh, care because they're puffy, they're edematous. When someone checks their blood pressure, it's high. And what do you do with those patients? You salt restrict them as one of your therapy, of multiple therapies. That's classic glomerular-based renal disease. But in fact, 70% of children who have chronic kidney disease in the United States have tubular interstitial disease. And by the way, tubular interstitial disease is where the mitochondrial uh, gets affected also. So tubular interstitial disease as a source of congenital renal disease or as a source of chronic kidney disease in children is often associated with cystic dysplasia. And it makes these children have an inability to conserve water and inability to conserve sodium. So clinically, my two favorite words for these families are the kids pee like a racehorse and they drink like a fish. I, I forgot that political correctness class years ago, sorry about that. So the term we're supposed to use is polyuric and polydipsic. But if you think about it, if you've got tubular interstitial disease and if you're a child with chronic kidney disease, you actually always are thirsty. You always are thirsty. We have children who are taking in liters of free water a day to maintain euvolemia. It drives people crazy. And actually, for the e if there's ED physicians in the room, and ER physicians in the room will often will identify someone whether they're hydrated or dehydrated not only based on exam, but based on the specific gravity, or if you will, the density of the urine. The density of the urine is, it typically goes up, like 1.040 if, if, you're, if you're dehydrated. It will go down to 1.005 or 1.010 if you're well hydrated. Well, that's the problem because if you've got congenital renal disease associated with interstitial disease, which is 70% of children, they always have a urine that is non-concentrated. They always are polydipsic, they always are polyuric, and it makes them risk for being chronically de dry, chronically volume depleted. So 48 hours ago, we had a 15-year-old show up at our ER who was complaining of being, uh, being uh, tired, and his creatinine was 9.9. .9. And for the, for the non-medical people in the room, creatinine 9.9 .9 is about 2% kidney function. So 98% of his kidneys are in a bucket. They're worthless. Can you imagine walking around with 2% of kidney function? But that's how children with chronic kidney disease present. Their symptoms are subtle, and their presentations are surprising. This child was also very anemic, a bit hypocalcemic and hyperkalemic. But I use that as an example of the subtlety of the world that I live in. So, Let's go back to mitochondrial disease. So why does my child, why does your child, why do you as a patient uh, get dehydrated easily when you have mitochondrial disease? Well, the kidneys are, you know, they're a pretty smart organ. I, we can tell about jokes about all the organs got together and who was smarter, but that's probably not what we're gonna do today. But they're actually very ox oxygen rich. Remember that your mitochondria are really functional in an oxygen rich environment. And what happens with, with mitochondrial disease you develop chronic scarring. And that chronic scarring is called tubular interstitial nephritis. Tubular interstitial nephritis is the exact same phenomenon that occurs in children who have congenital renal disease. The end result is the same. The way you got there was different, but the end result is the same. And like congenital quality renal disease, these children are chronically polyuric and polydipsic. They're always thirsty, they're always feeling dry, they're always draggy. But that's the funny thing, they don't always pee a lot. That's kind of weird. 
Think about that one. So why if someone is, has kidney damage, why are they have normal to low urine output instead of large urine output? Because their bladder is affected by the same disease. These children have my favorite disease called, uh, one of my favorite diseases called bladder dyspnergia. It sounds so cool when you tell people that term. It means the bladder doesn't function well. But it's one of those ICD-9 codes you can find for billing purposes, I think. But bladder dyspnergia is a phenomena that occurs from any etiology where your bladder does not squeeze properly. I had um, a large uh, liter of water on the way driving here from Richmond. I just had two cups of teas and I had a soda. My bladder is now affecting my discussion right now. <laughs> but at the same time, these children with mitochondrial disease develop bladder dysfunction. Not your fault, not my fault. This is what happens. And they're actually, the bladder muscle becomes disassociated. There's a term in the urology and the nephrology literature, you'll love this term, called non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder. Talk about an oxymoron with less of the oxy, right? The uh, non-neurogenic, neurogenic bladder is say, straightforward. You've got someone who's got spinal damage, their nerve doesn't go to the bladder, doesn't work. A non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder is an acquired process that comes in with the same result. You either have got uh, uh, overfill phenomena where your bladder has been overfilled for years, or you've got a bladder function abnormality that's associated with the inability to squeeze. That's called a non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder. It's also called in the literature, like most things in medicine, given the diagnosis as Hinman syndrome. You may have seen that literature. So what happens, there's a lack of coordination of muscles. So if you actually examine, think of my hands as a bladder, and I'm gonna pee this way on Dr. Teasley, okay? Um, this, this back part's supposed to squeeze, and this front part's supposed to relax. So I squeeze here, I relax here, and I, I, I just got Dr. Teasley wet. But in fact, actually that's what happens in Hinman syndrome or, or bladder dysmotility. There's a discoordination of these muscles. And actually in children with mitochondrial disease, there's a diffuse discoordination of these muscles. So what happens over time, this bladder continues to expand over time. These bladders, instead of having a typical child's, teenager child's urinary volume, which is about 250 to 300 cc's per void, they'll have an 800 cc void, they'll have a liter void. And they actually won't void uh, com completely. This is very similar to other diseases that we see in congenital disease. One's called Eagle Barrett syndrome, also called uh, Prune Belly syndrome. But these are actually have an inability to squeeze the bladder well. This is compounded by anal abnormality, by gut motility abnormality, where the kids actually ha cannot defecate properly, where the anus sits behind the bladder, causing just some disruption and squeezability of the bladder, and actually causes this whole myriad of constipation, GI illness, causes bladder dysfunction that you see, and faces someone who's making more urine than normal. It's a quagmire that actually makes life miserable for these kids. So what happens with electrolyte disorder? Why do they get electrolyte abnormalities? Why do they have sodium weirdness? Why do they have potassium weirdness? Why do they have, they have metabolic acidosis? Because, as I tell the, the patients we take care of, you're great, but your kidneys are just dumber than a rock. And the reason they're dumb in a rock, they've actually been scarring in the interstitial area. This tuber interstitial nephritis associated with chronic kidney disease, or the tuber interstitial nephritis that's associated with mitochondrial disease, makes the child have an inability to conserve salt. It can give you a proximal tuber defect, so you're wasting potassium, you're wasting phosphorus, and you're wasting water along with magnesium and calcium. Think of, if I were a cardiologist, and I'm not that smart, you need all those components to make your heart squeeze well. But if you're wasting them through your urinary system, you actually may put yourself at a risk of cardiac dysfunction. And the difficulty with blood work, it lags. It's a late finding, not an early finding in these patients at the same time. So does my child have electrolyte disorders? Well, the, the sodium causes a, a volume depletion. Interstitial nephritis actually would cause potassium phosphorus bicarb and actually is associated with hypokalemia, which by the way, will cause muscle weakness, will cause hypophosphatemia, which will cause muscle weakness, will cause hypomagnesemia, which I don't have up there, which will cause muscle weakness. It actually will cause bone disease. Metabolic acidosis is there because of bicarbonate uh, wasting and abnormal reabsorption of, uh, of hydrogen ion, and actually causes also muscle weakness, fatigue, 
And actually, a lot of the medications that human beings are given are not supposed to be working in an, in an abnormal pH environment when you're acidotic. So actually treating the bicarb or treating the pH is going to be important in these patients to make some of the other medications uh, work effectively. There's also other problems. Many of these children are on other medications that can cause a detriment to renal involvement. I've actually, I've seen a lot of kids with Topamax or Topiramate, incredibly wonderful drug, used for headaches, used for migraines, in adults used for weight loss, by the way, used for seizures. And I've actually had the honor of working with Johnson & Johnson a number of times where I've actually gone through their bone and uh, stone disease population. Because topiramate can cause a hypercalciuria phenomena, causes phosphorus wasting, all sorts of other perturbations. So think about if you've got a child who's got an underlying metabolic disease called mitochondrial disease, and they're on other medications that are very, very important to be on, but may have a side effect. It may be additive to some of the side effects they're running into. If you wind up with chronic hypomag, if you wind up with chronic hypo-K, hypophos, then you actually may develop rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is the fancy term that means that your muscles are breaking down. One of the problems you'll see with patients with mitochondrial disease is they'll have myositis or rhabdomyolysis. It is not completely because the kidneys are dumber than a rock, although in part it is. It has to do with the mitochondria on the muscles, which is an oxygen-rich environment, but it may be additive. So the body is smarter than we are. All these things actually have to be played in between. So why are they not picked up? Why can you not identify kidney involvement in mitochondrial diseases? Because the signs and symptoms are subtle. Because the serum creatinine, which is a blood test for kidney function, I tell their house staff, is probably one of the most worthless tests they'll ever draw in their life. It's helpful if it's abnormal, it's very unhelpful if it's normal. Why? Because it's a function of muscle mass. Those of you who do internal medicine patients, you know that there's an automatic GFR calculations or kidney function calculations in the computer for you to say someone, Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones, whatever, has a, a creatinine of X and has a GFR of X. That's automatic. It's not happening in pediatrics. Why is that? Because the CMS, which is the Medicare and the NKF about 15 years ago, came up with what's called MDR standards to help calculate that for internal medicine patients, patients above 18. The reason it does not happen in children is that they have a variable muscle mass. I tell our house staff, if you've got a patient with mitochondrial disease, or if you're a patient with cystic fibrosis, or you have a patient who's been chronic chemotherapy, and they have normal renal function by creatinine criteria, they have chronic kidney failure. Because that creatinine not only reflects their GFR, their kidney function, but it also reflects their muscle mass. So if your muscle mass has been disrupted all your life because of the chronic illness, guess what? Some of your lab work is not going to be as pathognomonic or characteristics of what they should be. So why do these patients get hypotensive? I'm an old guy. I'm going to use the old term. It's called orthostatic hypotension. You stand up in a hurry and you fall flat on your face, right? You feel dizzy. And you have concomitant tachycardia, your heart raises at the same time. Okay, those of you who remember the class where it talked about cardiac disease, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Okay, that's the linear cardiology part I know. You remember that actually if you are volume depleted, if you're dehydrated, your heart rate has to pick up to maintain the same degree of cardiac output. But if you've got actually any sort of muscle involvement, and with no offense to the cardiologist, the heart's just a really big muscle. It does a good job, but it's just a really big muscle. But if you've got muscle involvement, and that muscle squeezability is not perfect, and you have concomitant electrolyte disturbances because the kidneys are dumb and a rock, and you're volume depleted, not surprising, you've got a physiology where when the kids drive uh, stand up in a hurry, they don't feel good. And actually, on top of that, there may be a neuroautonomic dysfunction that's associated with it. The physiology besides orthostatic hypotension is incredible. If you look at the neuro literature, the, ortho, uh, the cardiology literature, the nephrology literature, we all look at different parts of the elephant. But actually, we come to the same conclusion. It's multifactorial. And you have to pay attention to the big picture, and you have to make sure these patients are volume repleted. So how, what's the mechanism? I mentioned you've got electrolyte disturbances. You may have cardiac effect for the mitochondrial disease itself. You actually may have uh, chronic um, autonomic dysfunction. And you may have the electrolyte abnormalities. And some of the things that we, we pay attention to are not always there. So, 
I was born with this thing. My mother, who turns 90 in December, still says to me, when are you going to shave that thing off? Well, she's a good old Irish, German, uh, Irish uh, lady, and the answer is uh, not, not today, Mom. That's the answer, right? So the question is, if you know how you got there, can you figure out how to fix it? And I'm not that smart. The, the real answer is, if you've got an acquired, in this case, nephrologic involvement of mitochondrial disease, the, the, the quippy answer, which is totally worthless, is fix the underlying disease, right? Fix the underlying disease, everything else will get better. And eh, not going to happen. But actually, you can do other things that may affect, in this case, renal function. Tylenol, good. NSAIDs, bad. We see one or two kids a year uh, come in at about, about this time of year. It's really great. They, they, these are big, stocky football players who have been doing 20, uh, two a days or three a days. They're dehydrated because they're sweating. They're actually having a lot of muscle workout. They take bunches and bunches of Motrin, and they come in right in kidney failure. It's awesome. Absolutely awesome. It's not because of NSAIDs or Motrin or Advil or Aleve or ibuprofen are bad for you. In the setting of having underlying kidney disease, in the setting of vitamin depleted, they will add to your interstitial disease. So if you can avoid NSAIDs, it would be nice. If you can't, then make sure they're hydrated. Be aware that a lot of the medications you use are, are, have some degree of uh, wasting of electrolytes. And in 1997, the federal government came to help us again, and they actually made these panels in medicine, the CMP, the BMP, all the things that all the medical people know to check off the box. Guess what? They're all missing a phosphorus. So unless you're thinking about how does phosphorus work in your ATP and how does phosphorus work in your metabolism, of your, of, your, of your cardiac muscle function, unless you actually measure the phosphorus, the answer is you have no idea what the level is, and therefore you should not talk about it until you know the data. It's not on the panel. Think outside the box. So bladder dysfunction. Well, we actually spend a lot of time with kids, not with just mitochondrial disease, but kids with, with, with urinary tract infection and other things. We talk about time voiding. What does time voiding? It means you pee on the clock. Probably not on the clock because it would be disgusting. No, but you, but you actually take, you get up, pee in the morning. You, sorry, I'm, I'm a smart aleck by trading. I apologize for that. Uh, Gene should have warned you. Um, you, um, you pee at 7 o'clock in the morning. You pee at 10 o'clock in the morning. You pee at two, uh, met, uh, uh, 1 o'clock. You pee every three hours. We actually have a, what we call a drink a lot, pee a lot letter that we hand to families in August. That goes back to school. Because the schools don't want the kids to be drinking a lot and peeing a lot. You need to anticipate some of the school issues. Some of these kids, unfortunately, need to be on clean intermittent catheterization, not something that any child or any human being wants to be on if they can avoid it. And there are some other medications, such as trazosin, which is also marketed as Hytrin, is actually allow, is, is used for people my age of 29 and holding who may actually have some bladder dysfunction because of uh, other organ growth. But actually, if kids actually have a uh, dysfunctional outlet obstruction, Trazosin may be helpful. That's the good news. What's the bad news? It's also a blood pressure med. It actually causes side effects of low blood pressure, and it causes tachycardia. So I'm not suggesting you should jump right onto it. But sometimes in patients who are replete, trazosin is not a bad, bad uh, discussion. How about orthostatic hypotension? A lot of the kids I know, Gene takes care of, that we see are on IV fluids at home. Basically, you're talking about salt and water loading. You need to salt and water load. When I tell my adult colleagues in nephrology, oh yeah, we push salt like crazy. They say, Bunchman, are you crazy? I said, that's a different discussion. Let's not be confused. These kids, mitochondrial kids, need to be salt loaded. They need to be salt loaded because they have a number of areas that they're salt wasting. And they actually sometimes to block the, block the tachycardia, in my perspective, this is, this is the Bunchmanism. I like to use short acting beta blockers, not long acting because you can titrate to effect a little bit better with the short acting. But sometimes the short acting beta blockers will have more neurologic effect and actually have school performance issues. So there's a downside of that. Now, how, how about the kidney involvement? Well, it's actually interesting. I've biopsied about a half a dozen to a dozen kids with mitochondrial disease. If you go back to look at that paper by Emma et al., you'll basically find that the findings on a kidney biopsy on a patient with mitochondrial disease is consistent with about four dozen diseases. There's nothing pathognomonic. What you may see, you may see metabolic acidosis on blood work. You may see other abnormalities. Gene and I looked at a series of kids, and often these kids will have concomitant nephromegaly. 
These kids will actually swell their kidneys for a period of time. Again, a nonspecific finding. Not pathognomonic of only mitochondrial disease, but pathognomonic of inflammatory process. So do I, do I suggest that all kids with uh, renal involvement should be biopsied? No, but if you're not doing anything next Tuesday, I'll be glad to take care of you. No, it, bi biopsies are sometimes helpful because they actually tell you what you don't have to worry about. So I'm just a nephrologist. I deal with funny uh, part of the world. I don't just deal with pee, I deal with all the electrolytes, the hypertension, uh, and all the other issues. And with apologies to people in the room who may have mitochondrial disease, I apologize for comparing it to, to lupus. But for healthcare providers, lupus is as a drug that people are intimidated by, but it's easy to fix. Mitochondrial disease is equally as intimidation, and it's hard to understand. So my perspective, you need to have a core team to work together. You need to have uh, the ability to talk to your colleagues. You need to have coordinated care. Gina's take the lead at our program. And actually, for the families, most of us medical people are pretty stupid. Uh, we see a lot of patients with rare disease. And I actually will tell the families, okay, what's the website say this week? Educate me on what I'm supposed to be doing. Because I have to deal with a billion patients. The family has to deal with one patient. Their job is to educate people like me to help me understand how I can best serve that next child who walks in the door. That's a partnership, and that's what this disease process is all about. And I thank you.